hi, I'm uh, Ted Smith. I guess folks around here refer to me as Farmer Ted, and uh, you're looking at 50 acres of what I love, which is basically Mother Nature and food production working hand in hand. And it's a lot of hands off, very rough and rugged, but it's about as natural as food production gets, and uh, it's productive. <music> Why do you have this uh, garden and farm? It's working for a living. You do what you love, right? This is where I'm at home. So why join the rat race and work, work eight hours a day doing something you really don't want to be doing, producing something you don't really know there's a use for here? I'm feeding people. I'm putting pretty plants in their gardens. I, I'm enjoying my life. You know, I'm doing what I want to do. I get to enjoy the animals. I mean, they're just drawn to this sort of an environment. So I'm pulling all those beautiful birds and animals butterflies in to be with me and it just all works out so why not why would you not want to do this so basically I eat for free this way but uh, I have the roadside stand and I supply at this point in time three restaurants in Manitoulin as well I used to do a lot of livestock as well I found I was working for the livestock whereas the gardens kind of work for me well, I say that after a 20 hour day but you know what I mean got the fruits and vegetables also uh, honey maple syrup I think that's pretty much it for the food production here on farm and you do some nursery stuff as well for a lot of plants yeah so spring sales for people that want to do their own gardens you know the tomatoes the peppers the cucumbers the squash the lettuce uh, all that stuff thousands and thousands of plants go through here so i like to leave these big swaths where it's just kind of weeds and all the birds nesting it the butterflies the pollinators uh the stuff that's beneficial for the garden you know, yeah. the guys are gonna eat the bad bugs and yeah. i a bad bug that's a very human way of looking at it but <laughs> Do you find doing this helps control the pests on the plants you put in? I hope that it does. I can't, yeah. I've never done an actual study, so I couldn't say yay or nay. Yeah. But it's the natural, it's how Mother Nature does it, right? Mm -hmm. There's got to be something to it. Yeah. You see so many gardens, and I mean, visually, I respect the gardener who's got this beautiful, clean, weed free garden. Yeah. That's the exact antithesis of what Mother Nature wants. She doesn't mm -hmm. want sunlight on the soil. It's right. the worst thing for soil mm -hmm. organisms. This soil with the protection from the sun is actually going to be full of living creatures. And, oh yeah, so this is my deer repellent. I have five standard poodles. Yeah. I take their fur off when I shear them. I save it in boxes and then because the deer love mowing these plants down. I just come out and I just spread it down the rows. Like I think it's smell. the smell. Yeah. 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 Oh. Plus hair is a big source of slow release nitrogen. So yeah. yeah, sunflowers are a big seller again. That's, you know, food for the table as, a, as opposed to the stomach. It's sort of an aesthetic thing. But, and then another place where I like the weeds is in the carrot patch. They protect the carrots as they're forming. So you can see, you know, you kind of got the carrots are coming up here now. And there's just rows and rows. And I grow the white, yellow, red, orange, purple, and sometimes even the black carrots. And so when you plant them, you, you till the land here and then you, yeah. you I, seed rows of them. Yeah, I till as minimally as I can but I do have to till down to be able to run the cedar through and stuff. This is one of the reasons why I, I kind of wonder how you know some of these no-till operations do certain things like how do you plant carrots in a no-till operation or say bush beans or something like that so to me minimal tilling is almost necessary on any sort of scale you know if you're really right. small scale you can probably get away with it but do it by hand maybe a yeah. little a little more and then uh do you do any sort of amendments here because the fish compost is the big one plus i do have my goats uh, i have some chickens so you know that as well and then all the waste from the greenhouses like for example i just put about five or six hundred heads of cabbage cauliflower broccoli etc that got black rot it's a bacterial issue and i'd put them into worm bins but i've got the same toast the fish compost is in i've got great big worm bins so that all comes out into the garden as so well. kind of some worm casting compost exactly. style yeah. yeah yeah the verma compost is top notch it's hard to beat that it's and as much as you see here too you've got the weeds which are generally beneficial but then you get some guys like this one that this is actually a problem and i wish there was a way of eradicating that that's your perennial sow thistle and it actually suppresses the growth of other plants so through the roots somehow yeah it's sort of a chemical reaction and so it's not a good one to have in here it's one of those ones that i if i have some spare time to try and pull a few but you get mm -hmm. little patches like this that pop up 
you know, the weeds protect the soil, they bring in pollinators, they harbor the uh, predatory insects. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they do take some of the nutrients from the soil, they do take some of the water from the soil, but at the end of the year, they get tilled back in and become part of the biomass mm -hmm. again. You yeah. will get more crop if you weed, mm -hmm. because there's no competition. I mean, yeah. I, I won't sugarcoat that. It, it does work mm -hmm. for increasing your crops, but I think that comes at a cost to the soil. Plus, it, it's a time factor. If you, I just don't have the time. You know, I'd have to hire somebody yeah. and pay them to do all that weeding. Mm -hmm. So that cuts into, you know, the margin. It's just, it's all mm -hmm. mathematics. Common barnyard grass. You pull it where I see it, and if I see one, I'll show you. It actually has the capacity to take about 80 to 90% of nitrogen out of the surrounding soil in a single season. That's wow. a huge competitor for your crops. So that's mm -hmm. where you need to know your weeds. Go, yeah, this is the one I'm taking the time on. Just, these were just some unsold plants. The main crop for that is down past the greenhouse. We'll see that, but at the end of, uh, about the end of June, I ran out of, you know, I wasn't selling anymore. People were down the garden, so I just stuck the leftovers in here. Some of them are actually popping up, so if I get something great, it's not. Eh. They're feeding the cucumber beetles. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm in the middle of pulling garlic right now. Yeah. There was another one we walked by, most of it's already gone. I mm. put in about three or 4,000 a year, but this is, so what I do is I plant the garlic in the fall, and now here's that fish compost. I come in and I compost over the garlic. So then, you know, this is what you're left with. Is oh, wow. Beautiful garlic that grow up. So this helps suppress weeds. Garlic hates competition. This is one place where you do want to keep the weeds out. So you notice there's a lot less weed competition in here. The fish compost keeps weeds from germinating. Uh, it also, you know, keeps the soil moisture high. And every time it rains, then it's a slow release fertilizer for the garlic. So I love that. Garlic's a clone. So you plant big, you get big. Mm -hmm. uh, eat the little ones until you got a good crop established. Fish compost is one mulch, but I also, I don't know if you noticed, we came by about 40 or 50 bags of leaves at the driveway. Uh, in the fall when people are raking their lawns, I try to discourage it, but if they insist on raking their lawns, then yeah, I'll come to town and pick up trailer loads of leaves. Uh, grass clippings, I've got a couple lawn, uh, what do you call them, lawn maintenance men, whatever they call themselves, that, uh, you know, they bring the grass clippings, trailer loads, and you can mix the brown leaves and the green grass clippings. That's your perfect, uh, you know, nitrogen Compost. carbon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. got to make sure you get it from lawns that haven't been sprayed, but yeah. with Ontario's pesticide laws now, most lawns are pretty clean. Mm -hmm you actually have a higher risk of getting stuff on straw from farmers now because most right. straw comes from grain mm -hmm. and the grain is generally sprayed with glyphosate here. Before this particular variety goes up, I'll go through and I'll pull out, you know, the biggest heads that I want for seed for myself for next year. Then the rest will go up for sale. So that's a great buy. I get a few bushels off that over here. But you can see I don't trim it. And you can see it's covered probably an eighth of an acre of grapevine now. <laughs> but the birds just love it. So mushrooms are another thing that I like to do. So. I've got rows of shiitake logs in there, and I also do some oyster mushrooms. This tree had worms in it, so you can see the whole tree oh. just snapped off and fell over. But one little branch grew out the side of it, of the leftover stump. And that thing, that's a yellow transparent. It's the earliest apple to ripen on the island, mm. and that thing just produces bushels every year. Wow. I don't know how it does it. I need to take some cuttings off it and, you know, put them onto some other trees just to maintain it, because I, it can only last so long like that. I do a lot of stuff in containers. Mm -hmm. It's just so much easier for me. Uh, and I can control up here. I do control weeds. These are onions, which don't like, they're like garlic. They don't mm. like the weed competition. So up here, you know, I don't mind dandelions. I let the odd one of them go, but I can keep this fairly clean. Um, you know, I'm even going to asparagus in a container. So this is mm. fresh from seed this year. Mm -hmm. It'll take a couple of years, but then I'll have my asparagus up here where I can actually keep it clean. It hates weeds as well. I've done my June bearing strawberries in big totes because that way I don't have to be on my knees picking. It's the other thing about aging, right? You learn to work smart. But I know I have to water them all summer to keep them alive for next year once they're done bearing fruit. So I thought I might as well make this worthwhile. So I filled them with a, a celery and celeriac so that all summer as I'm watering the strawberries keep them alive, I've still got a purpose and I've got some beautiful celery growing up in there. This is a neat plant here. This is kind of a funny one. This is a, I have an Australian friend who gave me some seeds from Australia. This is called the kangaroo paw. Oh, cool. So yeah, I can't wait to see how the fly. I looked the flowers up on the internet. They're kind of fascinating. So, yeah, this was the first one I built. So I didn't know what I was doing when I put this one up. So there's a lot of problems in here, but now a lot of these totes have all been harvested. I'm into like third plantings in a lot of them. This year? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, so you got some lettuce and yeah. things like that. Yeah, mostly I do greens here because this is a polyweave plastic, which diffuses the light. It makes it a lot less harsh. Right. When we go in the other greenhouse, which is a traditional greenhouse plastic, you'll see it's a very harsh light in there. So I do more of the hot heat loving plants. This was an arugula planting and I've just cut it down. I've put kale in to replace it. Mm. Uh, I got the black rot in my kale. So I'm trying to find new spots to put some of that for the fall harvest. If it's minus 40 outside, it's minus 40 in here, okay. but the, the there's enough um, mass in here that you get the, the passive thermal buildup 
and all night that sort of releases so that uh, things that you know would die out there they actually somehow survive in here like I have romaine lettuce uh, Swiss chard kale stuff like that that comes through the winter in here still alive it doesn't grow but it doesn't die and then in the spring it's off to a head start and boom and these are working greenhouses they're not show greenhouses so they're <laughs> kind of a pain I told you about my mother roses so this is kind of what they look like and the raspberries are an accidental happening, but they're turning out to be marvelous. Wow, massive raspberries. I'm eating raspberries in May in here. What? Yeah. And then you get the uh, Parthenocarpic cucumbers, which they don't need pollination. So we can see how they're going here. You know, they're just kind of getting a nice little start to them. So you pay a lot more money for the Parthenocarpic seeds, but they're great mm -hmm. because every flower is a female. You don't need the male flowers and the pollinators. And so these are the water totes. I have a big pump in the pond and I fill these with the, the big water pump. And then from here, I just use a small handheld pony pump and everything in the greenhouses gets watered by hand every day. That way, you know, eyes are on every single plant every day for pests, for water, for maturity, just an ongoing cycle. So if you like the taste of wasabi, and I'll tell you, it's a slow burn. When you first bite into it, it's like, oh, yeah, no big deal. Mmm, I'm tasting, oh, <laughs> I feel <laughs> That's the reaction. It. It's so good, though. So do you use this in, like, salads, or can you make, like, a paste out of it? My suggestion is get something like a mayo or a homemade sauce and puree this into it and then have that, like, on hamburgers and stuff. Uh, new grain bread, mm. they're trying to find a way to use this with roast beef sandwiches, which to me, that's like, yeah, let's go. That would be so good. How do you keep track do you, of, like, um, when to seed? As soon as I have space, I figure out, okay, what do I need next? It's basically as simple as that. Uh, like, it's hard to explain, but your mind, you just start calculating it. You know, you always know, okay, the running low on romaine lettuce, better get a flat started. And Do you ever keep, like, a garden log or anything like that? I have so many started garden logs that have no ending in them. <laughs> <laughs> Just get over too overwhelmed yeah. maybe by it. I just don't find that writing it out is productive for me personally because I write it out on paper and then I forget what the paper is. If I can't store it here, it's just... Mm. No, you just learn to run with it. Plant tags cost you about 10 to 15 cents each uh -huh. to buy. <laughs> I can make about 12 per yogurt container. <laughs> That's so smart. I was actually just thinking about your tags. I was like, okay, he just uses the plastic ones, but the yogurt contains. Yeah. So, you know, rather than send it off to the landfill or the rather dubious recycling that plastic undergoes, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's still waste at the end of the day at some point in time, but mm -hmm. we're getting another use out of it at least. And yeah. This is a neat one. This is a Peruvian crop and I can't show you what it is down below because it's a tuber. It's a small, colorful tuber. They're red and yellow and pink and all sorts of colors. They're called Oka. And you've probably seen shamrock plants for sale in stores, you know, the oxalis plants. This is an oxalis, but with an edible tuber. The trick to it is it needs a very long, moderate growing season, and it doesn't start to set tubers until after, you know, about mid-September. So you keep it out here all summer, and then when it's getting ready to frost, you got to move it into the greenhouse mm -hmm. and take care of it. And then all of a sudden, boom, just sets up all kinds of tubers. And you can eat them raw. They've got a very crisp... Uh, they do have the oxalic acid in them, so you've got that sort of a bite to them, but... They're a substitute for potatoes in a lot of places and a little bit similar to our um, the Jerusalem artichokes, if you've had them. Uh, nicer texture, though, closer to a potato. You know, a new crop of uh, romaine coming, and this is for, you know, the one food truck that I work with in Little Current. They use a lot of my romaine. That's and you're probably good. familiar with lamb's quarters, which... Uh, I don't see a traditional lamb's quarter in here, but this is a magenta version, much prettier than the, the traditional one. Oh, so yeah. I've seen that around. This was actually brought originally as a vegetable. This is more nutritionally complete than spinach or you know any of the greens that we grow in our garden. And the funny thing is, we pull these out, throw them away to plant a lesser crop. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I have this magenta version, which I love, and I maintain it. So I've got patches of it growing all over the place. But as I weed, I actually eat these guys. So this is half the skin. This is the third green. It's even bigger than the other one. I got to get the skin pulled in it and I want to put a fourth one up this year over in here a little smaller that I can heat and sort of get out there in February because right now my house looks like a giant grow up like <laughs> I have I did the math the other day and I've got something like eight thousand dollars worth of grow lights alone wow. because all the plants that you see everything grows in there and this doesn't even touch the house plants that I do like mm -hmm. I have thousands and thousands of house plants so so how do you how would you heat the greenhouse um it's gonna have to be electric now i do have a wood stove conversion kit for an oil drum and i've got the oil drum so i can put it together but again you have to feed that with wood mm -hmm. you know for the amount of electricity that it takes to run a heater in a greenhouse it's pretty insignificant really mm -hmm. and i'm on a some sort of a subsidy program for farming for electricity anyway so my costs aren't out 
out of the roof. But all down the center is tomatoes. That left side is pretty much all peppers. Uh, and then the right is sort of a combination of the two and some eggplant mixed in. And there's some things like ground cherries and tomatillos mixed in there as well. And there's one toad of basil. So I harvested on the weekend. So these are just the new growth in the last couple of days. And then I specialize in hot peppers. So I've got, I can't even think of how many varieties of hot pepper I grow right up to the Carolina Reaper, but I you know all the breeze nice. strains and primos and jigsaws and bubble gums and seven pods. This pepper is purple when it's green and then when it's ripe, it'll go red. So most peppers start green and go to red. Um, this one here actually starts sort of a chartreuse color and goes to red. And then some of them will go to yellow or orange. Like this particular variety, it looks terrible. It's called Sunbright and it's supposed to turn yellow, but all the leaves went yellow. And so I think it's a very weak genetic stock and I will never grow it again. That's the basil that was picked over just a couple days ago, but oh, there's the purslane. There we go. I knew I saw it somewhere. So, so it'll grow, it'll mat right across the ground. It's got very succulent leaves. It's, uh, it's got a very nutty sort of, um, well, here, I'll have thousands of them. So you're welcome to pinch a piece. It's got almost like a lemony, citrusy flavor to it. And, mm. and what did you say it is good for? I forget. This is the one that the archaeologists, or anthropologists is the right word, sorry. They credit this with allowing humans to sort of transition to more of a uh, mm. plant-based diet because this was so nutritionally complete. Yeah, squash, cucumbers, pumpkins, like both summer and winter squash, all kinds of watermelons, muskmelons, and there's the cucumber beetle. Oh, he jumped. But there's no shortage. I'll just find a male blossom and there'll be a thousand. There we go. So, yeah, those guys are the bane of my existence. Um, they are the single worst agricultural pest in this province, and they have cost me tens of thousands of dollars. Like, I just can't even calculate the amount of money that these things have cost me. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful little beetles, but man, they're damaging. All this skeletonization, oh, that's yeah. them. Oh, right. They'll chew on the fruit. Oh, um, wow. Now, that that one, that? So that's an Italian. That's a Cocazelle zucchini. Okay. The trick is, if you want to eat a zucchini with flavor, always go for the Cocazelles, the rib zucchinis. That's the only zucchini that really has an intense flavor. Leave it to the Italians, right? This is about food. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the Italian culture, I mean, if there's a culture that embraces food more than them, I don't know. And the Italian zucchinis are top-notch. Like, I just love that. These are my productive ones, right? These ones just, they reproduce like rabbits. Mm -hmm. And so that's the market. And I've got yellow ones and yellow striped ones, but... You can take that one and try it out. Oh my goodness. Thanks. I'm Thank so you. excited. There's like a natural hill here. And when I was going over the hill, the copper wires... Boom. Okay, I'm on a hill. I didn't get reaction in the low areas, but when we dug, Sure enough, there was a crack in the rock. So I asked the guy who was digging, and he said what happens on Manitoulin, this flat rock under pressure, sometimes it buckles and cracks. And so you've got a little hill where the rock has buckled over the millions of years, and the water oozes up through these cracks. So it's actually on Manitoulin, the water's often found on tops of these little hills. Yeah, I basically brought an excavator in. I said, this is what I want. I want the island, I want the hill over here. My goal ultimately is to put cold storage tunnels into that hill. Uh, I've got a giant dam at that end because the water all feeds from there, from there, and from there. All the drainage from across the road comes into this pond through culverts and stuff. It's one of the few things where a vision has actually worked out better than you hoped. <laughs> you know, usually you plan something, you get a wonderful idea, but it just, it just never quite comes to fruition. This one actually blew me out of the water. This was just a big dirt hole with big dirt sides. So I bought seed mixes, I planted the seed mixes I wanted. I got so many kinds of legumes and clovers and grasses planted in around here. I put fruit trees and different shrubs uh, and then I inoculated the pond once it filled with water so I went to some local creeks and I was bringing back trash cans after trash cans of water with all the little you know the microfauna and flora mm. like the little tiny mm. ones selled and up and I gave it a few weeks of that and then I was bringing in the larger bugs and snails and clams and crayfish and stuff and then I waited for about two months until it was full of life and then I introduced you know local fish species like darters, uh, dace, uh, creek chub, bullhead catfish and they're all, they've been in here ever since. And so the other thing is, is um, the water you're pulling out of here has got, got some nutrients in it as well. Yeah, yeah literally all the algae, uh, the duckweed, all the rotting vegetation, and then, I mean, all the animals that basically use this as their bathroom. It may not sound nice, but it's Mother Nature's fertilizer. And you know, I've just got a two inch uh, water pump and I've got a foot valve, a screen foot valve with a float on it down there. And I just drive it through a two inch uh, fire hose. And then this just goes up to the storage toast that I showed you by the greenhouse. So I can fill those. It takes about 30 seconds each to fill them. This is a big powerful pump and I've got spares in there just in case it goes down. 
Uh, and then I've got the water at the front, all those plants by the trailer. I've got a pond up there, but that's all solar fed. So I've got a little solar pump that I've got a little charger on the battery. And, you know, it gets enough of a charge for the day that I can water them once and it's dead and then let it recharge for another day. Yeah, you know, if you like nature and flowers and wildlife and stuff, it's awesome. It's something different around every corner, but yeah. if you're a fan of control and yeah. aesthetic, you know, it's, uh, cultivation and manicuring, uh, this is a nightmare. <laughs> you see I've got multiple bird feeders up in all winters. The, the amounts of different birds that come in here in the winter is just crazy. Really? In the winter? And it's funny though, when I first bought this farm, it was a virtual wildlife desert. Like, it was just... Everything was mowed. It was no trees, no shrubs, no flowers. It was just, as far as I'm concerned, it was just it's a very dead. Manicured. Yeah, it was a dead plot of land. So now I just mm. look at how it is. And how, 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 sorry, how many years have you been here? About 20, 21, 20, oh. I think. Yeah. Well, at one point in time, I did an educational farm where I was trying to help kids put a face on where their food comes from. So not really a petting farm, but more a this is actually farm houses, real chickens, real rabbits, real sheep. So I had sheep, goats, cattle, llamas, donkeys. I mean, you name it, I had, I had emus. But at that time, emus were part of the meat market. Like it was, you know, I was trying to teach kids, but my insurance company decided that children shouldn't be allowed anywhere near animals and basically said, lock the gates or lose your insurance. So I walked away like, so you see the remnants of the, you know, the educational farm. Mm -hmm. It was fun. I used to have the parking lot full of school buses and the, it was really good for the kids. Oh, so but, cool. Once again, you know, the insurance industry wrecks something the Dover building is. That was actually, you know, where you go in and buy your ticket. There was a, a, you know, gravel walkways everywhere. It was all man. Well, the sheep keep it manicured. When sheep are in here, it's like a golf course. All these cages were labeled with different creatures in them all. Um, there was a big gate up front for people. And this was just a busy happening place. And I still have people come here, you know, like, you know, big people now. They say, oh, when I was six years old, I came here. <laughs> hey, goats! There they are. Hey, goats! Come on, goats! Come on, girls! There come some little babies. Hey, guys! Oh, see, so these oh, little ones here. Goodness. Some of these are just a few days old. Really? Come on, goats! This one here is my oldest one, the, the naturally oh, called. Oh. She has no horns. Uh -huh. She looks like a little cow with her. Yeah. Markings. <laughs> She's got two of these little babies are hers. Oh, really? How uh, old is she? Uh, she? I've had her for about seven years. Oh, that little black and white one there is one of hers. And oh then the goodness. first white one that was also hers. Hey, Mama. You gonna come say hi? Yeah, strangers are always, you know, mm -hmm. they're a little nervous when they see faces they don't recognize. Mm -hmm. What are some of the challenges that you've faced in this type of lifestyle? Paying the bills. <laughs> really, Pests. I mean, the cucumber beetles I showed you, obviously, you know, things like that, the weasel in the hen house this morning. There are tragedies, but that's life at any level. No matter what you're doing, there's going to be little setbacks. I think the good so far outweighs the you know, the bad, for lack of a better word, that you know, I, I don't see a lot of setbacks. Probably if there was one issue with this place, it's that it's too short a season this far north. You know, the fact that I only get about four or five months to do this, and then, you know, you have to take on winter responsibilities to pay the bills, that's an issue. But you find the right person to work for and they'll flex for you and that's what I've got right now at the fish farm. I've lived in Toronto. You know, I could not do that lifestyle. It's the lack of people is good. On weekends I open up, the people that are I know and our friends, I come, we have a social moment, but at the end of the day I can sit down with my dogs with the birds and relax and I need that personally, not everybody does. But it's just part of what keeps me going is to be able to just disconnect from humanity for a while. Is the aspect of sort of living close to nature, was that something that was important to you from getting into one, this? Yeah, my mother still tells stories of before I could talk, I would, she'd have to check my pockets when she did the laundry because it'd be worms and snakes and my, I wasn't allowed to have a pet dog when I was a kid, but I, my walls were lined with terrariums and aquariums with spiders and snakes and frogs and fish and so from day one that's just what it's always been. Would you recommend this lifestyle to people living out on land? You've got to do some soul searching to find out if you want to live this leanly for back, lack of a better word but yeah i would definitely recommend. i think more people even just periodically should do this get in touch i mean you sit by the water fountain sip a coffee watch the birds listen to the bees how can that not be good for the soul what would be a way for somebody to kind of dip their toes into this do you think find somebody who's doing this and see if you can mentor for a week or two or a month or a summer and what kind of advice would you have for somebody that is thinking about kind of getting some property and maybe growing something themselves Research the area first, you know, find out, talk to other gardeners, you know, find out what the area grows, what the problems are, 
land costs they're becoming a big issue around here for a lot of people starting up that's probably the number one issue you know it's like the old saying there's only so much land they're not making any more and the cost of what is out here is going higher and higher so it is hard to get started uh, a lot of people i know are starting to use the communal approach where there's several different groups couples whatever on a you know part of property and each one has their own special niche and try to do their own thing that may or may not work depending on the blend of people but it's a possibility um, family farms are wonderful if you can inherit something like this you know that's the way to really go if you had to sum up what would your personal philosophy on life be just live it it's as simple as that i mean there's too much stress in the world way too much stress too much pressure the world puts it on us we put it on ourselves just sit in the grass you'll feel the sun on your face because you're only here for a little while if you are on facebook which is a mixed blessing uh farmer ted's is where you'll find me i have an instagram page where my photography is showcased and that's a randomly beautiful world so yeah those are the two places to find me and from there you can connect Hey everybody, I'm Forrest the Filmmaker, the person behind the video that you just watched. If you enjoyed that and want to check out more alternative dwellings, we have a playlist popping up that is all the episodes that we've ever done. There's van tours, tiny home tours, sailboats, off-grid, uh, garden tours, all sorts of cool stuff. So check that out. Thanks for watching. Hit subscribe. We'll see you on the next episode.